Welcome back to the Honest Athletes podcast. We are on episode three. We hope you've enjoyed the first two. I will just get straight into it. We have a familiar face for myself. This is someone that I work alongside. I've done some coaching courses with. And also we managed to fit in a swimming now and again. And and to be fair, we arranged meetings to talk about work and four hours later, six coffees in, we're still chatting about life. So someone really, really special. She was going to introduce herself. So Kate, please take it away. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me on the podcast. Um, yeah, I'm Kate Offord and my mum, um, just I'm laughing that you mentioned our swimming, Lauren, because I'm feeling slightly cringe that you've even mentioned it. Because when I said I was coming on this podcast, my mum actually said to me, oh, are you talking about your coaching or your swimming? And I was like, I don't think anyone needs to hear about my swimming thing. But you've mentioned it, Lauren, now. So yes, I have swum in a lane with Lauren and that's probably where we're going to leave it. So uh, yeah, um, it's kind of, you know, my workout of the week. But yeah, so thank you for having me on. Um, Yeah, I'm Kate Offord. I'm currently the head coach of Altrincham Swimming Club, where we've been lucky enough to have Lauren coaching with us. Over the last 10 years that I've been involved in the club, I kind of started off just as a volunteer coach, really. Um, I'd wanted to get kind of back into something else after having my kids. Um, I wanted to do something in sport. So I started sort of volunteering very quickly, became assistant head coach and then kind of moved moved through and devoted my life to the club, really. And um, so that's kind of one of my hats that I wear. And then on the other side of my head um I wear a triathlon coaching hat where I'm a level three triathlon coach um work for British triathlon in the coach education team and lucky enough to have um, my own business where we coach we've got a team of about 45 athletes that we coach one-to-one from literally anyone from beginner up to kind of GB age group um level so I kind of feel like I spin loads of plates and hope that I do everything okay and don't drop too many along the way. But yeah, I'm interested to be on the podcast and see what hard questions you're going to ask me. Oh, it's all good. We're not, we're not going to interrogate you. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious to know, because that's, that's got a lot of plates to be spinning. Which, I guess, came first for you? Was it the triathlon side or was it swimming or was it a mixture of the both? So back in the day, um, I was a swimmer growing up, Not didn't quite hit the dizzy heights that you two did, but I was like, I was a solid regional swimmer, regional finalist, um, you know, we used to win like national schools, that kind of level of, of swimmer, loved swimming, um, I really loved swimming actually, and, and quite a lot of what I do now is probably based on my love of swimming, and I, I kind of always question back, like, why did I give up, and I, I still don't. I still don't really have all the answers. And I think um, one of the one of the reasons was I had quite a serious um, surgery. It was like a major surgery on my neck when I was 14. And obviously that it came like just straight after the growth spur. And um, we had a new coach in our club. And he, it, we, I think I got overtrained and I didn't get much help getting rehab back in. And I kind of stopped training because it wasn't going well for me. But I got into coaching. So I did kind of the whole volunteering on pool side, did my level one and and kind of kept my hand in that way. Um, and then I went to uni, got what I'd call a proper job, um, moved to Manchester and and came back to swimming because obviously I didn't I didn't know anyone in Manchester. So it was a way of just making friends, really, that were not part of, of work. And I, I remember Googling um masters swimming manchester and manchester triathlon club came up and i thought oh that looks quite good and um i was quite excited my first session because james hickman was swimming in the lane you know so i have swum with some greats i may not have swum to a great level but i have swum with some greats and i remember he was in my lane and he like sorted out my tumble turns i'd clearly been doing wrong for like 20 years within the first session and it was all great and and kind of from then I got really into the club and started doing triathlon and you know just just loved being part of that environment then I had my first child when I was 29 and the job that I was doing at the time it was um it was a business development role 
and I'm I'm a bit well Lauren will know I'm a bit of an all or nothing person so I was like putting in 60 hour weeks you know relentless like traveling everywhere and as soon as I had Max I was like I can't I can't do that anymore and I didn't want being honest I didn't want to do that I'd gone from all and I was quite happy with nothing because I was putting everything into eating cake and, and being a mum basically so I realized I didn't want to go back to work and I was lucky that I could do that so I started to think about well what else could I do and it took me ages because I'm not creative I couldn't set up like an Etsy site and sell bracelets like I'm not good at that stuff um, and I was at a spa day with my mum once and I was watching this lady on the poolside and she was teaching swimming and my mum was like you could do that and I was like I could actually you know I've got I've got the qualifications like it's quite a good idea and it was all around the time of the 2012 Olympics and as I was driving home um, I think Alistair Brownlee had just won his medal so it was all really exciting and I happened to look on Twitter it's a bit of a long story but it, it's got a purpose and it said Manchester Triathlon Club were looking for new coaches and it was all kind of in this really small period of time and I thought I could do that so I phoned them and I remember going down to see them and um, I got on really well with the the guy who was the coach at the time and we just had this amazing conversation it was like it was quite a high level conversation for somebody that had just walked onto a poolside and had never coached triathlon before. And um, I remember saying to him, I could possibly give you an hour a week, maybe. Um, and he was like, yeah, an hour a week would be amazing. And I just got really into it. And obviously I, I literally volunteered every session I could. Um, and I, I threw myself into it. Um, and basically from that point, I, want, I just wanted to be the best coach that you could ever be. I wanted to learn I got just really I was I was really lucky um James Jolly who was the head coach at the time was a real I saw him as a, a thought leader and he was so willing to kind of mentor me and just talk to me about everything you know physiology psychology everything and I, I just wanted more of it um and, and so that was kind of my triathlon journey started there ended up doing my level two doing my level three um becoming head coach of Mantri, which I was for five years, setting up my own business. Um, and I just, the whole triathlon environment just made me like really thirsty to, yeah, to be better and to make other people better. So I only really came back to swim coaching because I wanted to coach more. Um, and I, I met someone at the track one day and, and she said, oh, old and swimming club are looking for some, some coaches. And I was like, right, take me down there. I live in Altrincham. And uh, I remember turning up and, you know, it's a great club, you know, Lauren, but at that time they had just like all these teenagers on both sides. <laughs> no disrespect to those teenagers. But I remember just thinking, oh, you know, and they were all just teenagers stood there. And, and kind of underneath it all, there was, there was just something that I liked about it, even though I was a bit like, I'm not sure about this sort of coaching style. Um, but I was really lucky I came at a good time and, and head coach at the time she she moved on and they got a new head coach and I came in as assistant head coach and and, and Chris Chris Starry really built up the club into something a bit special um, and he did it for seven years and I kind of was assistant head coach for seven years but I always did that secondary to the triathlon stuff it was never ever ever my ambition or in my life plan to to be the head coach I liked to just do I just did the little ones you know got them good enough to maybe go to counties that was that was what I loved doing and then Chris resigned in 2021 summer because he had a new job um I couldn't balance everything and I kind of was left with not a lot of choice <laughs> it was like are you going to be head coach or you know are you really going to want to work under somebody else because I am quite bossy I, I get that um and I had to really think about whether I did want to be head coach, if I'm honest, because I had quite a lot of other commitments that were quite important to me at the time. And it was it was a hard one to think, well, I'm going to have to give a lot of those up if I'm going to do this properly. But I decided I would, obviously. I was, ne I was never going to say no. Um, and I just thought, right, I'm just going to throw 100% into it. So I would say for the last what 18 months, I've I've put as much as I can into it. 
um the triathlon side is it looks after itself quite well these days like we know what we're doing with it it's you know it, it it ticks along really well but the swimming has been like a massive learning curve um and I've really enjoyed it but yeah so I say now swimming is at the forefront but it, it was always just kind of that side hustle so you've just taken us through like obviously how how much you've kind of not your life not your whole life but kind of such a big journey in in uh, you've obviously explained it in a very short amount of time but it's it's amazing to hear that even for me because I know obviously I know bits but to connect them it's like oh wow like how it how it kind of happened and it's really nice that I, I like to try and believe that everything happens for a reason even if you don't know the reason it just it helps doesn't it but your journey it kind of feels like that you know one thing led to another which is obviously how it works but I think what always shines through is your love of swimming through everything you love it but that's what you want in a coach in a in a parent in a if you're doing it yourself I get in and swim with you and it's great you love it so it's you need that in someone around you and as a head coach you need that obviously so it's it's really good to hear just your passion for it my my question though for you is obviously you swam yourself you swam kind of the same era maybe a little bit younger than my mum and my auntie and stuff like that what was it about swimming that you loved why did you love swimming so much and was it did you come from a swimming family no, that's really interesting. Um, I I went to a, a talk that Hannah did in COVID, and I'm pretty sure it was Hannah that said this. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said something about you kind of like being that kind of quirky one <laughs> that does something different than all their friends. Like, I kind of quite like the fact that I got up at four in the morning and swam for two hours and then went to school smelling chlorine because it kind of just made me just a little bit different I didn't have to be with the crowd can I just say you literally following on from a great episode where we literally just did a whole episode on that so thank you for that <laughs> well, yeah and, and so I think there was that was a that was a big part of it is, is I don't know I think I think swimming is um it's such an identity thing isn't it and I think the swimsuit guy last week said something about like if you don't love swimming then you do need to question like what you're doing because it it does take over your brain and your life and everything. And if you don't love it, then, you know, you have to question what decisions you're making. But the reason, no, no one in my family swam. I think my, I think my granny, there was like a medal from, oh, you know, when she was young and, and it was always quite a coveted medal, but it wasn't like she was a swimmer, but she obviously did have some swim ability by the sounds of it. Um, but when I was six, I think I'd always done all right in swimming lessons. And when I was six, my mum took me to do my 400 meter badge or something. And it was one of those days where you just kind of turned up and then you're supposed to do your 400 meters, get out and they'd give you a badge at the end. And I got in and I just was a little bit like Forrest Gump, apparently. I just like kept swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming until the session finished. And I did my 2000 meter badge. And I think at six, 2,000 metres is quite impressive, actually. Like, um, I don't think my kids were doing 2,000 metres when they're six. Actually, you're not really allowed to do that anymore, which is probably another conversation. But that kind of sparked my love of swimming because I got in and I was like, oh, my God, I didn't think I could do 16 lengths and I've just done 80 because nobody stopped me and I was I was loving life. So I think then my mum was a bit like, oh, she, she's quite good at this. She quite likes this. And, and then I got got into the local club when I was seven really gorgeous local club Chalfont Otters so if there's any Chalfont Otters out there it was such a lovely club um and my mum and dad have always been really supportive you know my dad was a referee my mum used to be the competition secretary and the marshal and she used to shout at everyone and make sure that they were doing what they they were told um and we, it was a really nice sort of family activity that we did um I mean, I just, I did always, I mean, I was in love with AJ Morehouse when he won his gold medal. I used to have posters of him on my wall. And I've told Lauren this before, there was a poster of her auntie on my wall as well. Um, you know, I was a proper swimming geek and and I just loved it. And, and I think, you know, I did think I was going to go to the Olympics. 
Um, my best friend moved to America and I was like, I'll see you in Atlanta in 96. Neither of us made it, you know, but it's nice to have dreams. And I think swimming, you know, there's always that chance, like when you're nine, why not you? And, and, and I think, you know, not that I tell anyone now or you can go to the Olympics, but if you don't dream big, then, you know, it's not exciting, is it? So, yeah, I, I just, you know, from six, being that Forrest Gump in the water, I've just loved swimming ever since. It's so awesome hearing those stories because there's some parts of it that are so relatable. And it is, it's that you, you can't fully explain it, but just that in-depth love for it. And it's not just the winning the medals or the personal best times. It was literally just being in the water. Um, and yeah, and I love that story about, yeah, you're only supposed to do 400 meters, but you're like, ah, let's see how far I can go. And you just go for it. So kind of coming back to a little bit with coaching, you are a female head coach. What's it like for you being a female head coach in this position? I guess it'd be intriguing to see because female coaches, there's obviously more male coaches than female coaches. So the fact that we do get more female coaches who are passionate like yourself is hugely valuable, but it, it can't be easy. Um, so I'd be intrigued to, to see from your point of view, what, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think there isn't equality yet and it's it's no it's not really anybody's fault it's more kind of societal so I know in triathlon I made quite I'd, I'd say we made quite big steps in terms of getting female coaches a bit more visible um you know when I was a female head coach in triathlon quite early and used to you know tutor courses and it would just be full of 40 to 50 year old gray-haired men that are all ex-military and I kind of love being the, the foil to that and and they didn't feel threatened by me I didn't feel threatened by them and it, it kind of worked it was interesting in swimming now so I always laugh but it's not funny it's not funny so I can go on poolside at regionals and they give the dad helper the heat sheets because they assume that I'm the mum helper and and it's it's women that do it as well it's it's not it's not a gender thing it's just it's just how we grow and you know I, I'm so pathetic but I I got head coach printed on the front of my t-shirt because I'm sick of people just assuming that I was the mum helper and you know just because you know and I, it sounds stupid but I've, I've thought of things like well maybe if I wear a baseball cap <laughs> you know I've never worn a baseball cap in my life but will I look more pro um and, and I've got over that now I haven't worn a baseball cap but you know it, it's those weird things and we went to a gala it was a little diddy meet and there was a problem with the leisure centre so they were only letting the swimmers and coaches through so they let all the swimmers through they let some of the teenage boy helpers through and then they stopped me and they were like no sorry only coaches and I'm like you know and, and it's nobody's fault but but the assumption is that a coach is male um, and they probably fit a couple of stereotypes within that. Um, and, and I don't know how we break it down. I mean, me and Lauren were at Stockport, weren't we, a couple of weeks ago. And um, the head co or one of the coaches at um, City of Manchester was chatting to me. And he goes, just have a look around here, Kate. Have a look. So I was having a look around. And he goes, you and Lauren are the only female coaches here. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't really understand it. It's like there's loads of female swimming teachers. There's loads of them. Um, but when it comes to coaching, I don't know what stops us. I, I mean, potentially it's like long weekends on poolside. Maybe it's the late nights, early mornings. It doesn't see, you know, female kind of roles. Response. I, I don't know. It feels like there's not excuses anymore because ostensibly we should live in a in an equal society. But the main the main thing that I've I've coped with is people just thinking that I'm the sidekick. And, you know, I, I don't really care, but I do because I think, you know, we do lifts to swimming with our neighbours. And I always want to say to the girls, like, why should people overlook you? <laughs> you know, like, we, I don't want a world where my daughters grow up and they have to be the sidekick because, you know, I've got just as many skills and just as many qualifications and, you know, maybe different skills than, than the next guy just next to me. And, and it's not, it doesn't come from coaches. There's not a, you know, I don't feel looked down upon or anything, but it's just people's assumptions. Heat at the moment, you know, they will give the heat sheet to the man and walk straight past me. You know, and I've had it with the officials as well. And I've I've gone and 
contested like a decision there was there was a, a result at counties where the, the timing pad had really messed up and they'd given our swimmer like a two and a half second pb i mean it was great but it wasn't fair so i went and i contested it and and basically i was kind of made to feel like okay yeah like pat on the head off you go you know and and then one of our dads went up and contested it and got a completely different response and it's things like that that i think you know, we need to work on for our girls in the future because they shouldn't have to put up with that. You know, I'm quite tough. You know, I might smile a lot, but you don't really want to cross me. And 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 I don't want our girls to have to grow up like that. Oh, it's um, it's a it's a tough one that because the reality of it is it's it is like that. You know, it's and I and I used to see the on teams and stuff like that when we'd have a female coach come with us on a on a trip I think the the female coaches would always get looked at a little bit differently I don't know why that was I don't know if I don't know what the feeling of it is either because we had some unreal female coaches on on the GB team and they know what they're talking about you know, get a, get a mixture of any, everyone's opinion rather than just go to the male coaches all the time. I, I always find that quite a lot. Just a quick one to Hannah as well. Did you get coached by a female at any point in your career? Because I don't think I did. I had a little bit because I was actually just thinking, listening to your story, comparing, I guess, the Scottish system to, I guess, uh, Scottish swimming and swim England in that sort of sense. And I think I notice more female coaches at like district meets where I'm based. Um, so I don't know whether there's maybe a bit more of an acceptance. There's also a lot more uh, female officials as well uh, for us. But um, yeah, so my dad was obviously my main coach, but we did have parent volunteers and uh, coaches that had help. So Ivan Adams was kind of the assistant coach to my dad. And then there was Gita Whitehead um and those two would you know take the lead from what my dad Patrick had given coaching wise but they would run the sessions um I when I was really young I had some help from um Elaine Adams um yeah there's there's a couple but it's not like as full-time as say what my, my my dad was doing but I did have some input um so yeah so it's just really really interesting because again is that cultural thing within the nation um or as you say is it like society specifically with swimming is it society specifically within certain regions of england within scotland um yeah it's it's, it's an, an interesting one uh, i've had i guess i've had a couple of coaches but not as in like full time the the ones that i've kind of had like proper camps and maybe one to one stuff have mainly been uh, patrick and i guess dave mcnulty when i've gone away on teams um so it has been predominantly male, yeah. We definitely need to change that, don't we? We do, but it's also, it's interesting, I'm just thinking back um, to the question you asked Hannah, because I did have a female coach and she was she was amazing. And actually I keep trying to contact her, but I don't think she really does Facebook, but she really inspired me. And I think she's coaching at Barnet Cocktail now, Christine Green. And she, she came into our club a little bit like you did maybe Lauren, like she was this GB swimmer that came to coach us. And I was totally inspired by her. But then I'm wondering, like, almost, this sounds wrong, but it's like, if you can put a GB swimmer badge next to a female, that's that's okay. But what if it's just, you know, Joanna Bloggs from around the corner who, who reads about swimming all the time? It's, it's how do you make it that it, it, you know, it's just a coach. It doesn't matter whether it's male or female. And if you get if you get kids to draw a coach, I bet they draw a male. That's a, that's a really interesting one because it's just made me think, like, would I be because I go and poolside and I don't I don't even think about it. But I think that's because I have the years of swimming so much and was lucky enough to make make teams. And so to have that bit of confidence from that, it kind of that helps. But you're right, you know, what about if you haven't had got that? Would I still feel as confident going on poolside? Maybe not. Maybe not, because I'd be looking around thinking, well, what's everyone think? Why well, you probably think, why am I here? You know, what do I know? So that's a really interesting one. 
Awesome. And I had one in triathlon, which was hilarious. And I'd, um, I was interviewing this this guy for, he wanted to be mentored as a coach by me. So he was like, I said, he, hadn't, he hadn't done any coaching badges. So he said, can I come down and chat to you at the track? And I said, yeah, of course you can. And this guy from one of the local running clubs also wanted to talk to the head coach, whoever that was. And literally, he nearly pushed me out of the way, like literally stood in front of me to get to this guy that I was talking to as a very first introductory to coaching session. And and he was so intent on it being this guy that was the head coach and telling him the whole of his running club's history and how they needed to use the track and everything. And this poor guy like couldn't get a word and go, no, no, you need to you need to talk to her. You need to talk to her. But it was just not in his it, it never occurred to him that I might have been the head coach. And, and it's hilarious because obviously I wasn't really that keen on helping him after that. Unfortunately. But but it's it's and, and nobody does it maliciously. There's no nobody's trying to push women out. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's just kind of a convention, maybe that we've got used to and and you know we need to just start breaking it down do you think then there needs to be more like workshops or courses is on I don't want to say like gender equality because I kind of feel it it's more a behavioral thing do you think there needs to be maybe like more behavioral courses on just coaches and you just get like a whole mix of coaches together and you know get them to a see for themselves how they behave and how they interact with individuals regardless of whether it's male or female or i mean what what do you think do you think there needs more needs to be done like is there anything specific that could be done that you think if you did that that would help an awful lot see i i don't think the problem comes from within the coaching community i think you know like possibly visibility from the governing body so like people like Mel Marshall you know you need like eight Mel Marshalls and suddenly you've got visibility and people go that's a great coach this is what a great coach looks like and then suddenly you've broken down those conceptions that all coaches have to look like I don't know Dave McNulty or whatever and it's that whole (laughs) I don't really know what he looks like but you know what I mean um but there's that whole kind of you know visibility in clubs you know like Stockport had a, a a female head coach you know what support did she get to be visible and to be that larger than life character that maybe other head coaches before or after her might might be you know there's that whole you know what are the governing body doing to raise the profile of of the achievements of of female coaches you know I think is it the there's, there's some really good female coaches at Millfield I mean Mount Kelly like Emma Collins Barnes like I mean she's amazing um you know, but she's one person in a big sort of cacophony of lots of voices. And I think, you know, it's we've, there's some great people out there that maybe it is about doing case studies. And I, I sort of feel like maybe we don't have to change our behaviour because we're already out there. We're already on poolside feeling quite confident, but it's just society needs to break down some of the stereotypes. I mean, what a conversation. A really interesting one is that one that's obviously not talked about enough. Because we've all just had a discussion about something that, yeah, it's happening and it really it shouldn't be and it's a shame, but it's important. Now, moving on to something different, which uh, me and Hannah just had the conversation before you joined this call, Kate, and it was something that you mentioned the other day about, I don't even know how you would describe it, but I would describe it as being babysat in swimming rather than a little bit of responsibility in triathlon and that's I mean that in when I when I went to Lanzarote and was around much more triathletes I'd only ever been around swimmers my whole life and so I didn't know any other way all I knew was you have a coach at every single session at every single race you get told how to race things what to do in training when to breathe, when to go to the toilet, like you were, you were, t- you were told this is what you do, and you are babysat. And I know you need that in swimming because it's a very technical sport, and I I understand that. Of course, I'm not saying it's wrong, but then when I went to Lanzarote, I was around triathletes, I was around Lauren Steadman, I was watching people train, and they were just getting on with it without a coach sometimes, and I was like, this is crazy. And you definitely mentioned something along these lines. So I would love for you to let us know what you learned 
as well and and what you've kind of I don't know taken on board from both sports in that kind of sense yeah so um I guess I think the first thing to say about triathlon is when I got so I got into triathlon coaching in 2012 and the first thing that really struck me is the kind of discursive level of generally the coaches so there's a lot less tell there's a lot less instruction um coaches that I have come across and certainly ones that I've mentored going forwards um they're much more willing to take a step back and say hang on a minute maybe I don't know everything you know there's a lot of in terms of if triathlon coaching they've been blessed with some quite reflective in in this country um some quite self-reflective coaches who have been willing to go right okay well this worked for this person is it going to work for that person that person that person whereas I think swimming has always been a little bit more like this is how we do it this is how you make champions and if anyone breaks that's their fault and triathlon isn't like that culturally because it maybe because it's a newer sport as well um so when I went into triathlon coaching I was really fascinated by you know you, you could say oh, I've, I've got a, a boy in my lane and he he does x y and z and if you if you said that to a, a group of triathlon coaches 10 years ago the answers that I, I would have got are you know well have you asked him you know how it feels to do this and have you asked him to try this and have you asked him is he happy at swimming you know all these questions Whereas I was in a situation 10 years ago in swimming where the answer might have been, you just need to tell him to kick more. And you're a bit like, okay, but there's many more sort of facets to any, any problem than that. So I think triathlon has come from a place of coaching, which has always been a bit more thought led and a bit more individual because also you can't you can't fit triathletes into boxes as easily you know swimmers you 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 know you're a fly swimmer you're a back swimmer you're a breast swimmer you're a free swimmer or you're an IM swimmer or you know that's maybe five boxes with triathlon you know some people are really good at swimming some people are really terrible at swimming some people are really good on the bike some people are terrified of riding a bike some people can run without any instruction some people find running so hard there's this huge spectrum um, of somebody doing the same time in a race but actually how they make up that race is completely different and what they need to train for that race is completely different so you can't really do a throw loads of eggs at the wall approach because more are likely to break than stick. So I think swimming has moved on from them and I, the conversations I hear now are totally different from that. And there's, you know, I've listened to some amazing podcasts with amazing coaches and read stuff. So that conversation is happening, but certainly 10 years ago, they were behind triathlon. And I think with triathlon, it's harder to, to squad coach triathlon. So you might have a squad swim session you can't always have squad bike sessions. You can't get 15-year-olds or 13-year-olds to go out on a group ride very easily. There's just too many variables. Um, you know, you can have track sessions, but, you know, how do you get kids to do long runs in a pack? You just can't. So there's so many different things to consider that I think you end up in a position where, you know, you do have to give them some autonomy. And what British Triathlon did was they had... Um, they obviously had a lot of success with Alistair and Johnny Brownlee. So they tried to look back at like, what was it about their history that made them so good? And I don't know them personally, so I'm not talking like I know them, but, but this is a story that people that I've worked with who did work with them at the time, you know, and their, their mum and dad were both doctors, I think. They lived in Yorkshire. They couldn't be rallying them to all of their activities. They were boys that were really good at everything they did. But they did like cycle to school every day on their own. They did just, you know, let them go out in the hills and just ride their bikes all day. They did let them have that freedom to to experiment with how they swam, biked and run. So, you know, those boys could push themselves through pain because they raced each other in the hills out in the Yorkshire Moors. There's all those stories. They do actually make sense. Whereas in a swimming pool, you're telling them when they have to swim fast. You're telling them, you know, when they feel good and when they don't feel good. Whereas in triathlon, what they realise is the model around like actually self-development was much better. So they developed this um, programme called Skill School, 
which kind of made coaches step back and they'd set rather than session, they'd almost set just objectives and the session would like flow. And I remember watching all these videos of, you know, what a good session might look like. And um, I always remember I was there um, as part of my interview process to be a tutor and they showed us this skill school session. And I'm not even being funny. It was chaos. There was a kid that bunny hopped over a tennis net on their bike. Um, <clears throat> there was like just near misses all over the place. The coach was shouting, challenge yourself, take it up a step. You know, and all these kids were doing amazing things. And then our job as part of the interview was to analyze that session. Now, I think I, for some reason, I went down on the like, let's not talk about health and safety. Let's talk about the coaching outcomes, which actually did get me the job. But there was a whole other half of the room who were just like, that was awful, that was awful, that was awful. There was no order, there was no, which is very much more of a how we've been swimming. You know, if we saw chaos in the session, we'd be like, stop. You know, everybody has to get back in order. You know, and it's that whole, so triathlon have tried things that have been a little bit left field. And then when you get into adults, adults haven't got time to be constricted by a coach. You know, so if they want to train to do an Ironman or they want to train to get, you know, a GB qualifier at standard distance, they've got to find the time themselves. So this culture has evolved where, yeah, they might come to a squad session, but actually they have coaches that write programs for them and they go off and, and do it themselves. So it, it, it comes from a very different place. But I think there is there is space for some of that in swimming, um, you know, and, and that whole being a bit more empowered as a swimmer to make your own decisions is, is important. And not all swimmers will want that. You know, I've got adults that I coach triathlon who are like masters of industry, you know, head of, head of, head of whatever. They actually just want me to tell them what to do. Like they're like, I have not got the headspace to be thinking about how I want to train. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. And some swimmers will be like that. They'll be like, you write me the set. Tell me how hard I have to swim and I'll do it. But not everyone's like that. Some people need to have a bit more control. And, and I think at the moment, maybe things are changing, but there's not a lot of room for that in swimming because it is so limited by pool time and lane space and, you know, how many coaches you've got and, you know, which leisure centres just shut down. You know, we've got all of these things. So when we're there in the pool, it's like, right, we've got an hour. Let's get on with it. So I think it's hard to compare the two, but I think swimming could learn some stuff from triathlon. Yeah, that's such an interesting insight as well, because as you were talking there, I was kind of thinking how much of it is that coach drive, but also how much of it is the athlete drive. And, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head there that it does have to come from the athlete. But I do think the coach is responsible for setting up that environment. And, um, and there's a lot within that that I kind of sat thinking, Maybe I should have gone and tried to try it. Because <laughs> I was like taking swimming sets. My dad was away flying over the North Sea. So I had to do a lot of swimming on my own. But it is, you, you kind of have that extra little bit. And you do see that in some athletes that you think, oh, you've got that extra bit. But um, if you're a coach that's got maybe 30 athletes, it is really difficult. And as you say, time restraints, pool availability, space. You know, I, I don't know the pool space um for triathletes do you have one coach to 30 athletes or is the numbers a little bit less I mean I guess it kind of depends it, uh, it does depend and I think I mean triathlon swimming is hard because in leisure centres they come like mm -hmm. even further down the pecking order than the swimming clubs do so the public gets the space then the swimming clubs and then if there's anything left over the triathlon clubs do and I mean at Mantri we were so lucky like we had we had like 22, I can't remember, it was something like we had 11 swim sessions a week um, when I was head coach. And then my side shut down for refurbishment. And it was like, oh, um, you know, and then we kind of got displaced. But I think they've got most of those back now. But, you know, that was unusual. Like most triathlon squads or triathlon clubs will have like maybe one or two swim sessions a week, unless you're at, a, you know, an elite level, in which case it's very, very different. Um, but I think that's what has led to sort of popping up of one-to-one -one coaches in triathlon because you can't get what you want 
communally and people will be like right I'm getting one session a week with my club but I still can't swim front crawl I need somebody to give me a one-to-one lesson so I can go and do it on my own because you can't do it on your own until you can do the stroke so I think you know triathlon has different difficulties but you know because people are used to being independent more on a bike and a run they're not as scared of going swimming on their own I mean, a lot of them hate swimming, so they are scared of going on their own, but it's not the physical swimming, you know, without a group that scares them. Whereas if you said to, you know, my kids, why don't you go for a swim on your own? They'd look at me like, why would I do that? You know, (laughs) I go with my friends and I go at this time. No, it's true. As you know, Kate, I now coach Mantri once a week on a Monday night. And I'm that coach that throws in I am and they all hate me for it, but they love it really and I just like to say they don't love it but you can think that (laughs) I tell myself that they do so I feel better no they they well they pretend they love it sometimes for me I think but no it's it is really interesting I always find that swimming because it's so technical it would be a great sport to train like maybe in tennis they have a one-to-one coach I think swimming would benefit from that massively I don't think swimming on your own would be amazing maybe a small group but I think because it is so technical it would be amazing if everyone could just find the coach that works best for them and they could just have that time with that coach and train whenever they wanted to and all that but you are so limited by pool space facilities yeah 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 of course you are now you've mentioned a couple of times that you have two wonderful children, one uh, which I torture sometimes in the pool. Yeah, and yeah. again, he loves me for it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But no, Max and Molly. So being the head coach of a club where you have two children in there, how is that? What what challenges or what wonderful things does that bring? Well, so let's start with the wonderful things because... Um, it's an absolutely amazing way to spend time with them that they don't even realise. Do you know what I mean? I sort of think at the moment we've got a good balance so they don't hate me and I'm not too embarrassing, hopefully. Um, But, you know, we do spend amazing quality time together and we do have really amazing highs, really hard lows. Like, you know, swimming's a tough sport. The social side around it can be tough sometimes. And, you know, but I feel like I can 100% percent be in their corner a hundred percent kind of understand what they might be going through so from that perspective you know I absolutely love having them in the club um I don't think there are any bad points I think there's things that you have to be really careful of um and you know I'm my own biggest critic I spend all day deciding whether I've done stuff right we all do don't we that's kind of probably why we do what we do um I think it works because I was there first so I was always at the club I was the assistant head coach it was kind of my my place and they were excited when they were old enough to come and trial and they did have to come and trial um you know it wasn't like they just got a place um and Max I remember his trial he he trialed at the same time as quite a few that are still in his squad Lauren and I always think so fondly because I'm like that was a really good trial because there was at least four of them that are still swimming and Max is seven um you know he's 13 now and there were four of them that are in that sort of performance top lane now so I think you know that was great Molly bless her she um she trialed I I was worried she had actually forgotten how to swim that day um but she did get in I don't think that was my decision but she did get in um so so I always feel like kind of I was established in the space so it was never me encroaching on their activity it was more like they wanted to join what I did because they are you know they are both quite good at swimming and it was a natural thing um I I think so Molly now um I do coach her um and I've I've tried really hard over the years not really to coach them you know we're quite lucky we've got different squads we've got different coaches I've tried quite hard not to coach them um back in the day I would say the biggest coaching challenges I've ever had and I hope she you know listens to this when she's older and she doesn't hate me for it but 
she gave me the biggest challenges ever as a coach because she just couldn't bless her and she's she's 12 now so she would have been like it was before covid she should have been eight or something she just couldn't make the distinction between me as the mum and me as the coach so she would talk when I told everyone not to talk you know she did everything opposite to what I was asking for and if I gave her positive feedback she couldn't cope with it if I gave her negative feedback she couldn't cope with it if I gave her no feedback she couldn't cope with it and there were sessions where I just thought like it was almost affecting everybody else because I could not deal with this obstinate little girl (laughs) that was you know and and she couldn't deal with me and 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 you know I was so excited when she was good enough to leave (laughs) my squad (laughs) because she was so hard and she found swimming really hard and I think that and we've talked about it since so it's not I'm not saying anything untoward she found swimming really hard and she also found me you know and, and she does it now like we go to galas and and sometimes she'll try and make me go to the loo with her and I'm like sweetheart I'm not your mum now I've got to look after all these kids and I was like you know would you ask this person to go to the loo with you no of course I wouldn't and I'm like well you just go like you know I know there's lots of big children there but you know and and and, and it sounds stupid but for her it actually works sometimes if she calls me Kate not mum on Paul's side just when she's feeling a bit needy um but I coach her now and she's absolutely wonderful to coach like she does everything that you would expect of a squad member she is really loving her swimming um so she's matured and she can deal with that I mean she probably hates me for half the set but she it it works really well Max was the converse as a little boy he just Max found swimming really easy in fact he finds swimming hard now he's 13 swimming suddenly got hard for him he has never found swimming hard so it didn't matter what I'd say to him, he'd be like, right, off, you know, I'd said faster, we'd go faster, whatever. So he was never, ever an issue. But I think obviously now being sort of 13, it is harder to have your mum there telling you off for back chat. And, you know, he does back chat to me because he can, you know, and I would never not coach him, say oh, I'm not coaching him, but I would not want to be his main coach because I just, I think I'm much better being the parent role now with him. He's got to that stage of swimming where he doesn't need me telling him whether his underwater was good or not. He knows that. He needs me to go, do you know what? Why don't you just, you know, think about your confidence, you know, just remember what a good swimmer you can be. I know it feels hard at the moment. He needs that. He doesn't need the like, well, your tumble turns were rubbish in training today or or whatever. So it, it's been like quite a difficult journey. No, it hasn't been a difficult journey with the kids. It's been an easy journey, but it has had ups and downs. I think the hardest thing that I find about being a parent and a coach at the moment in a small community, we are a small community club. We're not a performance center by any means. We've got some good performance swimmers, but we're a small club is the fact that a lot of the parents are my children's friends' parents. So there's this huge horrible blurring between my role as the head coach making decisions about who goes up into the next squad who gets picked for the relays who goes to the galas who you know wins swimmer of the year you know all of those decisions that you make as a coach you're not making it as a mum you're making it as a coach um and the fact that people kind of think I'm their friend and and I am their friend but also I've got a job to do and and there's that's the bit I found the hardest is the the pressure that comes from having this horrible gray area and there's a part of me that can't wait until the the younger ones come up and their parents are parents they're not people that I'd go out for dinner with and I love the people I go out for dinner with but you're always like oh god I can't make that decision about that child because it's so-and-so's daughter and -and so-and-so's my best friend or you know what I mean and and that's the really hard bit and sometimes I just feel like I'm just going to shut the shutter (laughs) not be friends with anybody um but my personality is not like that and I love my friends and it's it's trying to get the balance between making the hard decisions and the right decisions and the fair decisions and keeping your boundaries um and, and I think for me that's been the hardest bit to balance yeah it's it's incredibly difficult as you say when the lines get blurred between your profession and social or home life 
Um, I guess, you know, anybody who's listening might be a parent volunteer or a parent coach uh, with a child uh, in, in a swimming club. What advice then would you offer to, to somebody who is involved in a swimming club and their child or a sport or any sporting club, I guess, and their child is also involved? So, I mean, everyone has different reasons for getting involved. I would try and get involved to help the club not necessarily to help your child um, because that's not necessarily going to help your child you being there. Um, I think, you know, if you can get somebody else to look after your child so that you can parent them, that's always going to be a better outcome. And yeah, you can, you can support, you know, it gives you great support behind the scenes. I mean, we have really boring conversations over breakfast about like, you know, underwaters or crossover turns or whatever you know you can still support from from that perspective but I think you know try and do it for the benefit of the club rather than to push your child to the top of the tree because that's quite alienating for both you and for your child and probably for your relationship with your child um, and again I think it is about just having quite clear boundaries um, you know this is this is how you know when I'm on poolside I'm the coach when I'm at home I'm the mum and let's not get these two mixed up and it's hard to do and and I, I I've not been very good at the boundaries like I'll be like balancing kicking the dinner and Max is like fainted upstairs and I'll have some irate parent on the phone that's not that's not right that's not how it should be so I think it's about you being clear about your boundaries when I'm on poolside I'm absolutely 100 percent the coach and I'm giving everything to the club. When I'm not on Paul's side, I'm Max's mum or Molly's mum or, you know, and, and I think that's, as any sort of parent volunteer, it is about, you know, you're giving a lot of your time, you know, and people need to respect that, but you also have to be clear on your boundaries and not, you know, not talk ill out of school and say, oh, well, this this kid did this and all, oh, you know, you know, don't, you know, don't talk bad about other children if you're volunteering because you're, you're privileged to have that information but it's not really to be shared because it it's part of the club isn't it it's part of what goes on in the day-to-day -day training so it's just being careful I'm obviously lucky enough to witness this as well whilst you're at the club or away from it and no no and it's I wanted to say cut yourself some slack you're doing a great job it's not easy. We're we're human. We're not perfect. And you know, we had we were incredibly lucky enough to get Patrick on for two episodes. And there will be things that Patrick and Hannah will have got wrong. But actually you learn, you just keep moving forward and look where they got to. I mean, it's unreal, it's an unreal story. So it I think yeah, cut yourself some slack as well. Like you're doing a good job an amazing job and I think that's important for anyone really in that situation it's not easy it's really difficult I'm sure Hannah will agree just quickly now touch on smiling try I have smiley Miley I have smiling try I feel like I just need to smile this whole episode need to smile more Lauren <laughs> I need to change it to quickly smile instead of quickly sport, I think. Yeah. But tell us a little bit more about Smiling Try, because I think people need to hear about that and, and find where that is and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so Smiling Try Coach is my triathlon coaching business. Um, I set it up in 2015, so we're kind of nearly eight years in. Um. When I was head coach at Mantry, I um I had like a massive imposter syndrome that obviously I needed to do every qualification that existed. Um, so I did my level three and I was really lucky to have like a really good cohort of uh, just excellent coaches. And um one of them is like one of the head coaches of British Triathlon, sort of elite, elite division um now. And um I remember having a car, we were in the car, we were having this conversation and, and I was like, oh no, I'd never do one-to-one -one coaching. Like, who'd, basically, who'd, I'm just doing it for the club and who'd want to be coached by me kind of thing. And he turned around and he was like, but why would you not do it? I, I don't understand, Kate. Um, and, and one of our tutors is a guy called Simon Ward, who's a really good friend of mine now. And um, But he's like, 
kind of a coach extraordinaire. He was like the original, he was almost the original one-to-one triathlon coach. So he worked with like Jack Maitland, who used to coach the Brownies and Simon was like Mr. Leeds and, you know, literally coached everybody in Leeds. And, and, and this guy said to me, you could be the Simon Ward of Manchester. And it just made me laugh. And I kind of didn't really take it very seriously. But I got home and I was like, do you know what? Sorry, Simon, I don't want to be you. But I was like, I could do that. I could do that. So I'm quite um, I'm quite like an action taker. So that week <laughs> I set this business up and um, I was playing around with names. And again, it came back to that whole, you know, I offer something different because I'm a female. I'm not an alpha male age group triathlete who will train you in a certain way I'd like to think I'm you know one of the original kind of it's all about the person and you know, the holistic side and you know I, I, I coach the whole person hopefully so I was like oh what name could I come up with and and everybody used to call me the smiling assassin so I did this lovely logo with smiling assassin triathlon coach or something and then a couple of people said to me, oh, what's your new business going to be called? And I was like, smiling as that thing. And I couldn't even say it. It was like just way too long. So it became smiling tri-coach. And I remember one of my friends saying to me, doesn't that sound a bit crap? Like you're just going to all be a bit like, hi, smiling tri-coach. And I was like, no, because once they start training, they'll realize that that's not what it's about at all. So that was born in like 2015. Um, and, and I made loads of mistakes setting that up. Like I set my price point way too low. And I had like literally the whole of Mantri wanted me to coach them. And 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 not even, you know, I, I'm not being um, flippant when I say I nearly had a nervous breakdown. Like I had just taken on so much more than I could chew because one-to-one triathlon coaching is such a privilege because people are investing so much in you so they're paying you a reason you know good whack every month they've invested in a race or a series of races they've invested a lot of you know money time in kit and training and they really 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 want to do well and there's so many confidence issues and you know as an adult going into a sport you know jobs are hard to balance families are hard to balance elderly parents are hard to balance and and suddenly I found myself in this world where it was not about whether I'd set them a 2000 meter swim set or a hour run like this was it it, it becomes really obvious when you're coaching one-to-one it's not about the training the training's a stimulus you know, most people without being, most people will get better if you give them training. Okay. But what you have to do is, is get their mindset right and get them emotionally right and look at, well, why, why are you missing all these sessions? What's going on? Um, And I just suddenly was like, oh my God, I had these 20 people in my head (laughs) whizzing around all the time with all these different needs. And and I was terrified of somebody getting injured because I was like, oh my God, what happens if I injure them? Well, realistically, I have not injured anybody because, you know, everything's with a duty of care and it's training. You might get injured. And I was like, what if they don't do well? What if they don't, you know, everything was just so much for me. So the first year was a huge learning curve of me realizing how much I could take on and how how far you can push people and how much people really it's weird, like people love to talk about triathlon, but no one in their family or their friendship groups ever really want to talk about triathlon with them. So if they have a coach and they have a cohort of friends that do triathlon, it's it's such a release. So I took on, um, about after about a year or maybe two years, um, it was kind of growing faster than I could deal with. And um, I met the wonderful Melanie Hayes, who uh, Lauren has been working with as well. Um, and I also now- love you. She is, she is a legend. I mean, Mel's like a superwoman. So she's she about, is. she's about 10, 10 years older than me. Um, she's been to the Kona Ironman World Championship. She's a multiple long distance um, world tri- um, world age group winner. She's um, just the most incredible duathlete. She's an amazing triathlete and she's an absolute beast. And people always go, oh yeah, but it's easy for Mel because she's really good. Mel trains harder than anyone that I've ever met and she's such an amazing role model and I thought we were quite a good 
preparing because I'm not like that <laughs> but I'm very passionate about the coaching side so I'm not going off to Kona unfortunately um but the two of us together we've got the same values and everything so we created this sort of really lovely community of triathletes that we now coach one-to-one so there's about 40 of them in covid we kept everyone going we did loads of challenges we built a massive facebook community of like 600 people um and we kind of I think the values that we built were all around like community and sort of common interest and supporting each other. Um, you know, and we've got loads of people this year that have qualified for GB races abroad. Um, we've got loads of people that are new to the sport. You know, it, it, triathlon is for everyone. And I always say, it doesn't really matter how fast or slow you are. I, if I'm honest, I don't really care about that. What I care about is like, have you got like a high performance mindset? You know, do you want to do the training? Do you want to have the commitment? Do you want to work on your technique? Do you want to get better? In which case we can coach you over any distance. We do ultra running. We do, um, I had an amazing lady who did um, an event called Pure Peak Grit last year, which is like a huge, huge unsupported cycle race, which is like well over a thousand um, kilometers and you know people can achieve things whilst working full time and you know having three dogs and 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 I think that's what's really fascinating about it so yeah so we've got a Facebook page website Instagram and we just try and you know empower people to be as good at triathlon as as they can be um and it's a great community um so yeah it's it's I remember at the start I, I couldn't imagine that I'd still be doing it in eight years, but now I can't imagine life without it because, you know, we've just got so many great people that we coach and you get different things from each of them. And, you know, they all do get better. <laughs> they get really good. You know, you're saying something good when Hannah Miley gets the pen out and starts oh, writing. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I love being able to take notes of it because it is, it's so yeah because I, I i'm ab- not oblivious to triathlon but you know i don't know as much about it and i've got a huge amount of respect because you know i know life as a swimmer but then to throw in running and cycling on top of that <laughs> it's the mindset for me is incredible and um i, I knew someone who uh, did an event called the kelp man yeah yeah which, yeah which is crazy crazy, crazy. And I knew a girl who won it and like her level of commitment, because she was originally a pentathlete who then moved into doing the Kilman, as you do. And yeah, just just hats off to it. So I've always got a huge amount of respect for those who do triathlon at any level. Um, and, you know, that ability to come back to want to learn and, you know, smiling try for me feels like it fits because you do have to love what you do and if you love it you've always got a smile on your face so you know <laughs> and there is there is some science around like if you're in pain and you smile it makes you feel better so I'm always like it works it's real it's science come on yeah data on it you know <laughs> so yes yeah, so no, so and I was just making some notes there just because there's a lot of incredible kind of key points that you just mentioned there that I think are so important for for me personally as well uh because I'm still reflecting and looking forward and you know, I, I do come across some triathletes, so being able to kind of help guide and um, it is, and it is, it's such a growing sport as well. I've noted like over the last couple of years, it's really starting to become quite popular and, um, you know, a, any way to help everybody so that a minimizing um, injuries and making sure people are, you know, kind of getting the most out of it is, is, is ideal. And it is, the fact that they can do that three sports and have three dogs and a job on top of that. <laughs> and what what is it really right. incredible is um the amount of people that go right. I've entered an Ironman, and I'm like, can you swim? And they go, not really. You know, for us, like three thousand eight hundred meters as a swimmer is still quite a long swim, isn't it? You know, for somebody that doesn't swim, and you're gonna do it in a lake or in the sea. Mm-hmm. You know, that is huge. And a lot of triathletes are, t- are genuinely terrified of swimming, you know, and, and so it's it's a massive mind over matter. And I do think, you know, we haven't touched on this, but, um, you know, the fallout from swimmers when they, they reach a certain age and maybe they've realised swimming is not for them. Triathlon is a really good sport to transition into as a like, okay, so you don't want to spend 15 hours in the pool every day, every week now 
but you're still a great athlete let's not waste that there are other options and I always think you know for those kids that you know swimming's just they've done their time you know and I think the swimsuit guy was saying this last on the last podcast because it really really resonated with me but you know actually triathlon's a really good way for them to continue their identity as an athlete keep that discipline keep that mental well-being that sport you know hopefully gives us and and it it's still competitive but there's just different pressure you know it's like it's change a change is as good as a rest isn't it so I just think you know if there's swimmers out there that are struggling with their motivation like triathlon's really good fun you know you don't have to be a triathlete but do a triathlon because it's fun it will be great for your all-around fitness and it might just take some of the pressure off your swimming because you'll realize you're an amazing swimmer when you see the rest of the world yeah kind of my like getting the pen out okay is like paul hollywood giving you a oh my god i feel so um yeah i'm still trying to wait for the pen moment i'm like (laughs) You got any pens there, Hannah? She's waiting, she's waiting for your moment, Lauren. Even she if you knows just it's pretend, there. Hannah, one episode after I've said something, get the pen out and just go wave it a little bit <laughs> and then write yeah. down what you're having for tea later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's actually what she was doing. Yeah. <laughs> just drawing smiley faces and do that. <laughs> no. I made notes on the previous episode. I was just Did a bit you? more assassin like with long. it. Went on for too long. <laughs> I'm joking. We we've got covered quite a lot of really key messages here, and there's some been some fantastic points, especially you know talking about female coaching and the sort of society. Sorry, the dog squeaking in the background there. Um, <laughs> the so, so changing societal norms. It's not a quick fix, but you know we are starting to see more and more female coaches being on pool side. So hopefully we're heading in that right direction. Um, and yeah, and even just the advice from being a parent coach as well, because there are so many individuals out there that want to be involved in their club and that advice you gave was, was really uh, important. But for me, I, I kind of feel we've we've covered quite a fair bit there. I think just very quickly on Hannah's point in that whole like female coaches, I'm just trying to think a lot of the coaches that you see coming from swimming into coaching do tend to still be males at the moment. So maybe some girls making that transition from swimmer to coach and maybe clubs actively encouraging that. Um, I mean, actually at Ultrium, we are probably the exception. But if you if you look at a lot of squads, it seems to be a lot of male coaches that go from swimmer to coach. And certainly everyone you've had on your podcast seems to have done that. Um, but yeah, just just, you know, making sure that girls know that the pathways are for them as well true really important there to finish on this episode Kate thank you so much it's been really interesting to discuss so many different things that are relatable but also you're obviously in a very unique position with all the things that you've got going on so it's it's really nice to hear so thank you for your time thank you very much for having me I've really enjoyed it yeah I really appreciate you inviting me on yeah, no, it's been it's been a it's been a pleasure to have you on. We hope the listeners, everyone that's listening, and we hope you've enjoyed the episode. And we will see you next week for another episode of the podcast. <laughs>